Hi everyone, I'm Gretchen Bailey with Optometry Times. And today I have the pleasure of being joined by Paul Chamberlain, who is Director of Research Programs Myopia at Cooper Vision. And Paul is going to tell us a little bit about some new results that are coming out uh, after six years of patients wearing yeah. MySight contact lenses. So Paul, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me today and share these very no exciting Gretchen. results. Yes, yeah, pleasure to join you. Hi, everyone. Nice to be here. So why don't we talk a little bit about uh, the study? And I know that we're talking about six-year results, but would you give me just a quick summary of what the study. the study is, how many kids you've had, and where we are up until these results? Yeah, sure. Happy to. So, so this is the continuation of the original MySight study that ultimately we used to get the FDA approval of, of last year. So that study was that we started off with 144 kids aged between eight and 12 at baseline. We had four clinical centers around the world and we randomized them uh, into a double mass study. So in the, uh, triple mass actually, neither the parents, the children or the investigators knew what uh, the kids were wearing. And we followed them for three years in, in either my site or Proclear One Day, which is basically my site material and geometry just without the, the optics. And so at the end of those three years, we, we assessed the difference in myopia progression, spherical equivalent or axial length, the usual way between that groups and we reported on part one. And so at the end of those three years, we had a decision to make, right, because the original consent form was, was only for a three-year study, but we wanted to continue to learn and understand about myopia progression as these kids went through uh, teenage uh, years. So at that point, we decided, um, as I think other researchers have subsequently, not to continue the placebo group, but to, to give those kids in the control group, placebo group, an opportunity to, to get the treatment. So for part two, we consented them for a further three years of assessment, but um, both groups were now in the MySite one day lens. So it was now no longer, no longer masked. Um, it, it was just an open label study. And of course, then when you've got two groups that are in exactly the same treatment paradigm, you've got to change your focus somewhat. And so rather than in part one where we're really looking for a difference between the two groups, really what we're trying to do now is look at the long term growth rates or progression rates of these kids and see if being in treatment for six years or versus three years makes a difference into that progression rate because everything else about them is the same they're the same age between the two groups so the same ethnicity mix between the two groups and so on and so forth so that's what we did so, so what today is the six-year data sorry oh i i stepped over you sorry so you said you were looking at if there was a difference from being in the lens for six years as opposed to three yeah is there yeah. a difference no, so basically the, the headlines of this is that the, um, the, the group that switched from the control lens to MySight for three years, I call them the MySight three year group, uh, progressed over that part two period exactly the same rate or no major difference in the, in the rates between the MySight six year. So they're still getting the same progression rate. I can't tell you how much myopia control we're gaining because we no longer have that concurrent control group, but I can tell you that those groups are progressing at the same rate, even despite those differences in, in, in treatment durations, probably telling us that myopia progression, whether you're in a treatment lens or without a treatment lens, is very dominated by age. Age is a, is a really dominant factor in the annualized rate. So these kids started at age eight to 12? Eight to 12, so it was an average age of 10 at the beginning. So the, so the, the groups both were average age 16 at the end, but between 14 and 18. Did you notice any difference then in those kids for age of onset? So if there were kids who are age 10 when they started or age 12 when they started, were there any differences there? Yeah, the, the, I mean, so that was that's in the first part paper as well. So progression rate is different in older kids than it is in, in younger kids. What we could show when we did that as part of the FDA approval, it's in the labeling as well, that you actually see that the, the difference that you accrue, which we can now in part two, but the difference is still about equal 
between a, an eight-year-old progression. So they're faster in the control and they're faster in the test than and slower in the test and slower in the control at age 12. But uh, you certainly see a declining rate and certainly with the axial progression, which is um, I think a really accurate measure, you're, you're starting to see in both groups now as they get older, as the average age goes towards 16, that you're seeing in both my site groups a much slower rate of progression that you saw um, at the beginning of the study. So it sounds like what these results are telling practitioners uh, is that age of initiation is really, really important that you want to get these kids in myopia management as early as possible if they are showing signs of developing more and more myopia. Would, is that correct? Yeah, that, that, that's, uh, that's certainly true. So I, I don't think uh, there's any debate there that the sooner you can get kids in, the, the better. I mean, it's good news that, that these that the children that started the part two in age 13 are, are progressing at the same rate as those that start at 10. So they're, they're still probably gaining some benefit, but no doubt that, that always earlier is the better. Right. Are there any other key takeaways from this study, well, from the six-year results? Lots and lots. <laughs> <laughs> Can you pick out maybe yeah. one or two big ones that yeah, you yeah. think practitioners should know? Yeah, I think, you know, I mean, I'll, I'll get into some of the um, myopia progression data nuggets, if you like, in, in a little sure. bit. But I think one thing that's really important to recognize is this is now a six-year contact lens clinical study where a large number of children have been monitored in great detail behind the slip lamp and so on uh, every six months. And so we had no serious adverse events for six years, which I think is amazing. Well, no contact lens related. There was a, a, a herpes zoster related uveitis uh, from one child, but that's, that's it. So the, the safety profile is excellent. And you can imagine probably if, you, if uh, the audience, you know, look at contact lens clinical trials used when we're doing slit lamp grading, you know, and in a clinical trial, we grade absolutely everything from limbal hyperemia to vulvar hyperemia to corneal staining and so on and so forth at every single visit. So, um, and uh, we had a look at the number of times that an investigator would grade something higher than two on a typical zero to four ISO scale. So two being mild, so anything moderate or severe. Um, would you believe that over the six years of study, including unscheduled visits when kids actually came in with a quote unquote problem, nine times in six years did an investigator grade something higher than a, than a two, which I think is something like 4,000 opportunities to grade something greater than a two on every one of limbal hyperemia, corneal staining, and so on. It's an amazing figure. And with so you can imagine. Too. And yeah, right. So again, and six years really represents what most people getting into myopia management, you know, that's a, that's a, that's a lot of aftercare visits. So I think that's a really encouraging sign in terms of, you know, some practitioners maybe watching this that are looking to really fit kids in soft contact lenses, daily disposables, of course, uh, for the first time. I think that's a really amazing uh, um, finding that's got nothing to do with myopia management. Right. Um, so safety is one, I think, just in, and, and the high compliance uh, of the wearing time through the six years. Uh, so the kids were happy to wear lenses six plus days a week, 13, 14 hours a day, no problem at all. And that was consistently the same at every visit through the six years. There's, there's very little compliance issues. So they're wearing them full time. They're having virtually no findings of any incidents, which is all the sort of things that practitioners at home will be worried about as they fit kids for the first time. And then, and then when you think about the myopia progression, so as I said, we've got no concurrent control group anymore so you need to think a little bit differently how you uh, how you look at this data one of the if you like really exciting endpoints that i thought out of the three-year paper that came out a couple of years ago um, and still practitioners and scientists ask me a lot about was that we set this level of stable myopia and so we decided that a spherical equivalent was less than minus a quarter diopter so sphere plus half sill, then, then that could be classed as stable myopia and, and, and any practitioner probably wouldn't be changing the box power at that point. And so the mycite group in isolation after three years, 41%, nearly half the eyes hadn't changed by that amount. 
So, you know, you could say to a parent, well, one in two eyes in, in, in a recent clinical study stayed stable for three years. So we had a look and said, well, what is that number now after six years? Right? So twice as long. And it's still at 23%. So still one in four eyes were basically refractively stable through, uh, through six years. That's a, I think that's amazing. Wow. That's yeah, again, really important news, especially for doctors who want to discuss this modality with parents showing that type of data. Yeah, exactly. I, th I think that's something that's really translatable, as you say, for, for practitioners to talk to parents and, uh, and, and sort of relate the, something very tangible to them in terms of you know, the number of times they have a change in prescription. Um, amazingly, actually, the six-year total change in that MySight group, if you, so I think it's minus 0.9 diopters over the full six years for that MySight group. That um, uh, you'll see in the presentation, that I draw a line along the x-axis with that. That 0.92 diopters was exactly the same level that the control group had already reached. Remember their age and gender and ethnicity matched and everything. They had already reached minus 0.9 diopters after two years. So it's taken a further four years for the MySight group to get to that same level, which I think gives you some kind of, if you like, time context of how much myopia development we're saving. Um, and I think that's where a six-year study really comes into its own in terms of trying to set expectations for uh, practitioners looking to fit my son. I think setting expectations is important, um, that practitioners need to understand what they can expect, and therefore they can better explain that to parents because parents want to know what, what are we getting into, what does this mean, where will my child end up, and I think that type of information will be very, very helpful. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it's difficult to repeat a six year study, you know, we'd have to wait a long time for data like this again. So it's good to be able to take those sort of take home messages from this data. And that's what we're really trying to do with this. So what's next with these kids? Do you plan to follow them for another year or two? Um, are you in the midst of something now? What can we look for next year? Um, so, yeah, you, you, you've got it right. We've got another year. So we decided at the end of um, uh, when we planned part two that there, there is a question throughout the, the industry is, you know, what happens when you take a child or teenager out of myopia management contact lenses? Is, is there a quote unquote rebound effect? Do they, do they, does their myopia development speed up to catch up where they, where they would have been? And so there's, you know, there's a little bit of data on there with, with interventions like atropine, but not much in terms of, if you like, optical interventions. And to, and to me, this was a really good opportunity to answer that question, because after six years of treatment is more realistic uh, time where, again, practitioners might be fielding questions from parents to say, do we now fit them into a, a, a non-myopia management? So this seemed like the perfect time to do it. I've never really saw the point of treating eight-year-old kids for a year and then take them out of treatment. That just doesn't seem very real world to me. Yeah. So yeah, that's, that's next for this study is to see what happens when they're, when they're back in a regular single vision contact lens and, and did that rate of change alter at all. So that'll be this time next year. And so you pulled all the kids out of my sight, those who were wearing for six years and those who were wearing for three years. Yeah, and we'll see if those rates are different between those two. If you had to guess, what would you, what do you predict? Well, it's never been done before, so it's difficult to predict. I mean, I, I hope that the rate will be exactly the same as, as the prior year, if, if not slower, because they're a little bit older. Um, but those differences tend to be fairly modest when you just look year to year rather than over larger periods. So I would, I would hope that it would be a pretty similar rate. I would hope that that effect is, is locked in, but we'll, but we'll see. We'll have to see, right. So for practitioners watching this, if you could give them one or two key pieces of takeaway information, what do you want practitioners fitting contact lenses to know from this information? Yeah, I think I, think I want them to know that, you know, this, the slowing of myopia progression, whether we define that by spherical equivalent refraction change or axial length change, seems sustained over a long period of time. And I think that's really encouraging news as they look to maybe go into myopia management first time this is not something that's going to looks like it's going to 
wear off or speed up after a couple of years. And I, and I think, you know, one of the things this long study has really taught us is, you know, when we think about the kids, right, they get so much benefit out of contact lenses. They, they, from all the data we have from questionnaires and from wear time and compliance, you know, they, they adapt fantastically to contact lenses. They don't have many problems. And so, you know, a child doesn't really see slowed myopia progression. Right? They, just, they, do, they, just, they just see maybe that they've got more freedom for sports and, uh, and all of the cosmetic advantages of, of contact lenses. And I think, you know, to have, it, it would be amazing thing to have six years worth of data on any age group in, in a contact lens. Right? Um, but the fact that we've got it on this one and, and the compliance and the safety data is so strong, I think is a really great thing for us as optometrists to know that we can you know venture into fitting younger kids into contact lens and they get a lot out of it and you know as eye care providers that's you know that's really what we should be uh, looking for absolutely well we'll probably have another conversation in a year then about what uh, what the data show so paul thank you so much for talking with me today and sharing that information anytime gretchen pleasure to be on